Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? What a powerful time of worship. Right? I'm going to know that God is, is good and that he's worthy. Melissa, I had a word for you. You want to hear it? <laughs> like, sure. Hebrews 11.11. 11. Hebrews 11.11, 11, it says this. It says, it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. So that's a good word, yeah? Anybody can take that word. How many wants that word? How many is waiting for God to do something? Amen. Lord, I thank you for this time. God, I thank you for the opportunity and the honor to be able to share your heart with these people. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and that you would touch every heart, that you would touch every mind, and that the words that come out of my lips would be pleasing to you and from your heart. In Jesus' name, let it bring transformation and change in every heart that's here and watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. How many were uh, watched the documentary, The God Man? How many was here to watch that? That was, what'd you guys think? Was it good? One of the, the things that, there were several things in that documentary, and if you haven't watched it, I would encourage you to watch all of his documentaries. Darren Wilson, I think every single one of them are very, very, very good. But one of, one of the scenes in that movie, The God Man, was this. There was a couple that went to Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, and they were missionaries to people that lived in the dump. I don't know if any of you have ever seen pictures of the dump. I didn't even know that there was a place that existed that actually people lived in a, you know, when I think of dump, I think of American dump like Sorona, you know, and you go dump stuff, you know, but it's like they call it the dump because it's poor. They went there and they brought the beginning, they asked the question this, they said, why, you know, do you give these people food and clothes? Because they, they have no food and, and they're, they're poor. And they said this, they said, yeah, we, we did that. And then the next day, they were hungry and naked. He said they, they changed something up and they, they brought Jesus. Say Jesus. They decided to bring Jesus, not that they were not giving them Jesus, but what they were doing is trying to give them what they needed spiritually, naturally. But see, when you meet the spiritual need first, the natural things change. So they decided to bring him Jesus. And this one lady had a, she was depressed and anxiety. And I, they, I, I think she might've been like schizophrenic because they were saying that she was hearing voices and she couldn't get the voices out of her head. And they said that they, they gave her Jesus. They prayed for her. She went through a deliverance. She got set free of oppression and all of those things. And she was a completely different person. Interesting enough, she still lived in the dump. We don't understand how spoiled we are here in the United States. So they interview her and her living situation still the same. Nothing changed there. Still living poor. Her face was so radiant and so bright. And when she was talking, you can see how full of Jesus that she was. And they asked her this question. They said, if you could have all of the money and if you could not live like this and trade Jesus, would you do it? And she said, absolutely not. But here's the cool thing. Is even though she lived in a dump, because she had an encounter with Jesus, her perspective of living the same way, the way, same way she was living was completely different. Her... Oh. I believe that the Lord is asking the American church to grow up. I think that we complain and whine about things. We need to go visit Rio de Janeiro and take a trip to the dump. Amen. 
We're all getting tickets to go to Rio de Janeiro. Maybe we can get a discount if we all, you know, call the airline. Can you imagine call that? We'd like to rent a 747 because we're all going to the dump. I want to read something for you guys. You guys okay? I love what that song we were singing. It says, he brought me back to life. Did you guys enjoy that song? He brought me back to life. And I was imagining that, that passage in John 11 where Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave. And I believe that there's a lot of you here who are alive because you're born again, right? The Bible says when, you're alive, when you get born again, you're alive. But I believe there's many of you that are still in the tomb. I don't know what that tomb is, a tomb of unforgiveness. Listen, I'm preaching this morning. A tomb of unforgiveness, a tomb of bitterness, a tomb of jealousy, a tomb of offense. You can be alive and live in a tomb. Wouldn't, isn't that the saddest thing in the entire world? That we get born again and we live in a tomb. But today he's calling your name to come out of that tomb. And it's up to you if you're going to walk through that. Amen? And leave the grave behind. You've got heaven before you and the grave behind you. Heaven isn't when you die. Heaven is now. Heaven is your attitude, actually, in your situation. I read this. In an article, it said that adversary does not perfect character. I'm going to say that again. Adversary does not perfect character. It reveals character. I'm going to say that again because it's so good. Adversary does not perfect your character. It reveals your character. It exposes what is happening inside of you. All right, can I read this to you guys? You guys good? This is a, you guys remember Peggy Nunley that was here? This is her book that just came out and I was reading this story and it really kind of went along with what I just shared with you earlier. So it was about 12 years ago, my husband and I, not my husband and I, this is Peggy's husband. They, were mobilized, they mobilized a medical mission team into a restricted access nation in North Africa on this particular day, they were in a Sudan, Sudan, I can't say it, Sudan, yeah, yeah, there you go, it's the Cajun out of me, a ref, it was a refugee camp. I can still feel the intensity and surreal sense of courage and grief in the air, like it was yesterday, as one young mother came to us for help. She began telling us that she was raised a Muslim, she was from a very faithful Muslim family and had, arranged, and had an arranged marriage to a strong Muslim man. Early in their marriage, she explained that God began in interrupting their lives. Isn't that just like God, to interrupt your life? Her husband had a dream about Jesus, and it was so impactful to him that he instantly began seeking to know more about the Bible and the truth about Jesus. Shortly after she had a dream, Jesus appeared to her and confirmed that he was the Christ. Come on, man. Both she and her husband obtained a Bible. Isn't that interesting? They obtained a Bible. We have like 10 Bibles in our house that have dust. They obtained a Bible. They believed in Christ and they secretly converted to Christianity. They instantly began evangelizing. Right, Ben? Ben's like, yeah, that's my kind of book. They instantly began evangelizing. See, when you become passionate about an encounter with something, you will evangel you're evangeliz evangelizing about something. We're always evangelizing about something. Whatever we believe in, we're evangelizing about. They ev immediately began evangelizing. Before they knew it, they had gone public. Go figure. And even though they had opposition, say opposition. Even though they had opposition, they persevered, say persevered. They persevered and began having meetings in a building. The things we take for granted. 
Did you guys think this morning when you woke up, I wonder if they're going to bust us this morning? If we're going to get busted or if they're going to close the building? Only if it was COVID, but not COVID. No, we don't worry about that stuff, right? You get up, you get dressed, and you go to the building, right? As word spread to family members and government officials, it became evident that Veronica and her husband would not convert back to Islam. One evening as they gathered in their church, a mob came, led by Veronica's father and government officials. They burned down the church and they arrested the members that had converted from Islam to Christianity, including Veronica and her family. The local Muslim pastor came to the prison and pleaded with Veronica to convert back to Islam. She refused. She could not renounce her faith in Jesus because she knew that he was the truth and she could not deny that. After he left, the guards brought her husband. They told her to convert, convert or watch her husband die. Her husband pleaded Stay strong, Veronica. Don't do it. Weeping bitterly, she said, no, I cannot deny Jesus. No sooner had those words left her mouth that the guards beheaded her husband. Before she could recover from the shock of what had just happened, the guards brought her two sons. Again, they called her to renounce her faith or her two boys would die the same way. Her sons pleaded with their mom and they said, stay strong, mom. They reminded her that Jesus was enough. And we whine and complain that the church isn't doing enough. We should fall on our face and repent, don't you think? They said Jesus is enough that they would go to a better place. With uncontrollable tears, she pleaded with the guards not to hurt her children. She declared her love to them, but said, that she could never renounce her faith in Jesus. Is Jesus enough? We say it because we're here in a nice, comfortable building, right? She told her boys that Jesus was everything and that they must hold on to him no matter the pleas. The guards again beheaded her two young boys just like they did her father or her, her, her husband, their father. It gets better. <laughs> this is, mess I really have a good message. I, I will get there. Veronica wept uncontrollably. She felt as though her whole body was dying inside as she lay on the dirt floor of the cell. Now she's covered in blood. The guards angrily began kicking Veronica. You see, Veronica was six months pregnant. They kicked her until she miscarried the baby. And now Veronica sat in our mobile clinic asking us to examine her because of the pain in her stomach. You see, Veronica had much deeper pain than she felt physically. We joined hands and we wept with her. And it was, it was as though her grief became my grief and her pain became my pain. But what so affected me was not that Veronica grieved the loss of her family, which she did and she was, but it was Veronica's hope. She continued to tell us how God had provided for her to be released from jail and one miracle after another, she, exc she, ex she exclaimed, 
how God provided for her and her remaining daughter. It's pretty powerful, huh? Jesus is enough. Is he not enough? He is enough. And you young people that took the step this morning and got baptized, it really marks a new life for you, a new beginning for you, that you can live your life solely for Jesus. Amen? And you can tell and you can instantly evangelize. The thing I believe that the American church, a lie that we believe is that people are just going to walk into a building. It's interesting because if you read in Luke 15, the lost coin and the lost sheep, they actually were sought after. When something is lost, it needs to be sought after. You guys tracking with me? The world is lost. Our job is to seek after the lost. And it's interesting, the prodigal had to come to himself and realize that you got yourself in a pit, repent, and came back, and the father was waiting. Isn't that interesting? So that was the introduction. That just really messed me up because adversary does not perfect your, perfect, perfect, it doesn't perfect your character. It does not perfect your character, it reveals your character. How many times we go through something and things come out and you're like, holy cow, I didn't know that was inside of me. Trials and adversity show us what's inside of us so we can change it, right? I'm thankful for that. Ah, oh, okay, I'm gonna do something here. You guys okay? Okay, all right. Let's see if I can get to this message. The thing that has been on my heart is the fact that God's presence is with us always. Amen? Bible says in Habakkuk 2, 14, it says that the awareness of his glory, which tells me that his glory is here, his presence is here, but the awareness is up to us. Does that make sense? Being aware of his presence. I love that story of Veronica. It's like she was aware of the presence of God with her while her family was being beheaded. Isn't that crazy? That even when we're going through hard times, listen, people, even though you're going through a hard time, his presence is with you. Right? His presence is with us. It's our responsibility to be aware of that. In Judges 6, I love Judges. How many in here ever read the story of Gideon? Gideon is like a really, really cool story. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. You guys ready? Judges 6, verse 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. It's interesting because Gideon at this point is actually hiding. He's hiding in a wine press away from everything because he's afraid. Okay. The Lord appeared to him, which means the Lord found him. Isn't that crazy? Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. This sounds like a lot of us. Um, Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, then why is all of this happening to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us? and handed us over to the Midianites, who's talking to him? The Lord. Knock, knock. Where, where is the Lord? He's right in front of you. Apparently, Gideon was not aware that the Lord was in front of him. Hello. Wakey, wakey. Verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, aren't you thankful he's patient? I tell him that all the time, Lord, thank you for being patient with me. Apparently, I don't, I'm, I'm a slow learner. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go, I love that, never even addressed what he was saying. 
This is what the Lord's response was to his whining. Remember Gideon's whining. If it's, if that's really where is the Lord, you know, where are all the miracles? He says this, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites because I am sending you. Verse 15, but, the, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? I am weak, my whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. You guys want to give him some cheese with that wine? <laughs> it's like he, the Lord's cutting crackers and cheese for him. So here you go. You can have this with your wine and the wine press, whining in the wine press. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. And you're fighting this army will be as though you're fighting one man because I am with you. I love it that the Lord appeared to Gideon. He came to him in his hiding. Do you know that you cannot hide from the Lord? How many have tried hiding? Maybe not physically, but you do the passive aggressive. Nobody in here is passive aggressive, I'm sure. You know, it's like, well, you know, God, you did this, but you didn't do it my way. I love how the Lord addresses Gideon's true identity. He didn't respond to Gideon's whining or the way Gideon felt. He responded, he called Gideon out and who Gideon was. He's... He saw, listen, Jesus sees you not by how you feel. How many feel mighty sometimes? Sometimes we do feel confident, right? But most of the time I would say that we probably don't feel, like Pastor Bob said last night, he said, when you pray for people, the Lord spoke to him and said, when you pray for people, you pray as though you've never sinned. Right, honey? I'm not making that up. He said that last night. You can check it out. It's no longer you that live, but Christ that lives in you, right? We need to understand that even though we might mess up, the Lord doesn't call out our mess up. He calls us up out of our mess, right? The prodigal son is in a pig pen. He, he put himself there. Right? He put himself there because he left the father's house. He left, got himself in a mess, came to himself, which means he had a revelation, the aha moment where, okay, I messed up. If I, he knew who his daddy was, he says, if I can go back, I know that I can at least be a servant in my father's house. He came back and the father's like, dude, just like you never left, come in and threw a big party for him. Isn't that beautiful? No longer I that live, but Christ lives in you and through you. But the problem is, is sometimes we have things in our life that actually take the place of him. You ever try to smash something and you got a glass? I wish I had a glass jar here, but you have a, a glass jar that's full and you're trying to put more stuff in there, but it's full. See, if you've got bitterness, offense, and all those things in there, it's taking up an area that belongs to the Lord. And the only way that God can fill that spot is for you to give him that spot. Because he's not, he can't consume what, we, what is not surrendered. Right? So the Lord finds Gideon. And he begins, Gideon begins to tell the Lord all the things, you know, all the bad things. Isn't that crazy? We're so quick to just talk about all the bad things. And that's Okay. Just don't stay there. So the Lord tells him to go and change his circumstance. The Lord didn't say, Gideon, honey, you've worked so hard today, hiding in the wine press. You, you just, you just, you overworked yourself. You were up early in the morning and you were, you know, all of this stuff you're going through, you're going through so much. You know, you're just, you know, I get it. I, you know, Mike, you just, you just, yeah. So let me go fight. Let me, let me go take care of that for you. 
That's what we want him to say. We're like, God, you go do it for me. You take care of it for me. And he's like, uh, no, you go in this strength of yours. And it'll be as though you fight one man. Gideon says, how am I going to go? I'm the weakest. Bingo. When we are weak, he is strong. Admitting our weakness is necessary. But we don't whine about our weakness. We say, I'm weak. And you know that God will always, most of the time, always, ask you to do something that you're weak in. Right? He's not going to say, hey, you know, go do something that you really love to do. You say, step off the bridge and there's nothing to catch you. Trust me. Right? <laughs> it's like, ah. But it's in his, in our weakness, he is strong. He was encouraging Gideon. Gideon, I know you're weak. Go in this might of yours because I am with you. See, there's no place that you can go that he is not there. None. And I got proof. You guys want to hear it? Psalm 139. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me. You read my heart like an open book, and you know all of the words that I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. This is, this is how God sees you. Isn't this cool how he knows you? You know that he knows your name? You guys been married 12 years? Very cool. Happy anniversary. Is it today, your anniversary? Ah, oh, very cool. Happy anniversary. Verse 5. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow me behind. Oh, follow behind me, sorry. Follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You have laid your hand on me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Where could I go from your spirit? Where can I run and hide from your face? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you're there. If I fly into the radiant sunset, you're still there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me and your strength will empower me. There's no place that you can go that he's not there. But he wants you to be aware of his presence. Amen? I just absolutely love that. And I think that he's calling us into a season of that. When I was in Oklahoma, I had this, we were in Oklahoma a couple weeks ago with Ginger and Merle. They have a, a cell group down there and they're really doing a great job in there, um, you know, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And if you know Ginger, it would be crazy. Um, I mean, she's like started in, in her hometown in Blackwell. They didn't have a thing called the National Day of Prayer. You know, like here we have churches that get together. You have National Day of Prayer. You pray for our nation, blah, blah, blah. They didn't have that in her town that she lives in, but they do now. Isn't that crazy? It, takes, it just takes one person with the passion to do that. Do you know that we can actually see our city saved? You guys believe that? How is it going to happen? Cricket, cricket. All it takes is for you to ask one person, is there something that I can pray for you for? That's it. And then pray with them. Right? It's that simple. Right? Did somebody share the gospel with you? How many in here were, were saved that were saved like somebody shared the, shared the gospel with you? 
They came to you and said, yeah, imagine if somebody would not have done that. Anyways, we were in Oklahoma, and we, I was doing something for the ladies there, and during worship, I had this vision. And in the vision, I saw some of these ladies in there, and they were carrying a backpack. And it was specific for a couple of the ladies that were there, and they were carrying a backpack. And it was really heavy, and I could see it was, they were getting very, like, you know, tired and weary. And, you know, I was just like, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just ask you that you would take that backpack. And, you know, and I'm like, Lord, what is in that backpack? This is all during worship. And he's like, it's a fence. And I'm like, oh, dang. God, I break the spirit of a fence off these women. That they're going to be able to walk in their purpose. And they're going to walk in there. And I'm just, in this, I'm just declaring and I, spiritual warfare and whatever. And the Lord said, I ain't taking it. I'm like, what? <laughs> Binding and loosing and spirit of offense. And he said, offense is something they picked up and it's something they have to give me back. I was like, are you going to tell them that? <laughs> I'm the visitor and I should be the one they like, <laughs> right? We're trying to build relationship here. We're not trying to like, Bring enemies. So I get up to, to share, and I started talking about that. I, sh I shared the vision that I had, and just like what I shared with you, and I told them, I said that it's something that you have to surrender. Because like I said earlier, the Lord cannot consume what is not surrendered. And if we want God to have all of us, then we need to give him the things in us that don't belong there. I believe that offense and unforgiveness and bitterness has been tolerated in the church. We have made excuses for it. We have programs for it. We have all kinds of, we can give you the one, two, three step of how to live life not offended. We just make the backpack a little more comfortable. We put a little bit you know, more pads on it so we can carry it. But the fact is, is that offense will actually stop you and keep you from experiencing the presence of God. It's going to keep you from the awareness that he's there. Offense, I believe, is the number one thing in the church that causes division. It, it does. People get offended. We get offended and we carry this offense. And now, if I'm offended with Sam, hi, Sam. You didn't make my latte the way I want my latte, so. You guys should go to Roots. How many people have been, been in Roots? If you haven't been to Roots, it's in Cumberland, and you should go because they make really good scones and really good oat milk maple lattes. Just saying. Anyways, now I'm like completely off subject, and I'm really wanting one of those maple latte things. But I, I really do. I believe that we've become, we, we've become accustomed to living with the things, it's kind of our tomb. It becomes our tomb. Offense becomes our tomb. Living with unforgiveness becomes our tomb. Well, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they did to me. I am not forgiving them. Anybody in here ever do that? I have. <laughs> they deserve it. The problem is, is that you're the one that's suffering. You're the one that's carrying all the junk and you're the one that's irritated all the time. You're the one that's frustrated. You're the one that can't understand why don't I feel the presence of God. It's because you're carrying a backpack full of junk that we need to give so that he can fill us. Amen? So that we can actually experience and be aware of his presence. God will consume the offense and he gives us himself to replace to replace that in our lives. And I believe that it's time that we as a church in America be different. It just takes one. Can you imagine that church in Africa? They show up one day and they all get arrested because they're in a building. The building gets burned down. Can you guys imagine that? We don't, we, we don't imagine that stuff, right? Because it just, that stuff doesn't happen here. But it's happening. 
So I think it's time that we just reevaluate what are we doing? What are we doing? Is it, is it fun to just like carry the stuff that we shouldn't be carrying? Do you think Veronica, after just seeing her husband and kids beheaded, was offended? Anybody in here hear of Corrie Tin Boom, the hiding place? Do you know that she had a guard that had killed, I believe, killed her sister and I think had raped all the, anyways, what whole, awful stuff. And he got born again. And she had to go and she saw him and she's like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't forgive him. But the Lord really spoke to her about forgiveness. And she went and she forgave him. Isn't that crazy? See, there's power in forgiveness. We, the Lord is giving us an invitation, just like Gideon. Mighty man of valor. Go and just take over. But we're stuck in a tomb or we're stuck in the wine press of offense, unforgiveness, whatever those things are. When we surrender those things, he takes those things and he gives us more of him. Amen? And he gives us the grace that we need. We need to walk in forgiveness. All, Amy, I can have you go to the piano. Please. That sounded really hard. Amy, go to the piano. <laughs> you ever do that sometime? My husband calls me tonal. You ever been called tonal? You know what tonal is? It's the tone of your voice. You, you, he says, you're tonal. I'm, I'm not tonal. He's like, you are tonal. You sound mad. I'm like, but I'm not mad. But you sound mad. Well, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> We've been married 35 years. He should know me by now, right? She says, why you do ongoing marriage counseling? So we stay married, you know? It's just what I'm saying. I'm kidding. But I'm not kidding. He says I'm tonal, but sorry, I didn't mean to sound tonal. Really, all of this is just, I just kind of gave you a hodgepodge of things because that story of the God man and that, that couple, that missionary that went to the dump, and that woman that had an encounter with Jesus and then the story of Veronica and her, her family, it really messed me up and it really caused me, I really repented a lot because I realized how selfish I was. I realized how many things I took for granted. How just coming to a church building, you know, is like to meet, to be able to worship the Lord, how we just take that for granted. I don't have to worry that guards are going to come in and, and arrest us all and burn up our building. I don't have to worry that guards are going to throw my husband down and say, you know, if you don't renounce your faith in Jesus, that we're going to kill him, you know. But it really had me thinking about the importance of priority and why we exist. Why do we become born again? You know, we become born again because we're going to hell. When you get born again, you don't go to hell. That's, so that's a plus. That's a good reason, right? But the other reason is, is so that the same thing that happened to me, I can bring it to somebody that was going to the same place that I was going to before I met Jesus. And I believe we, we become so comfortable in just wanting to come into a building and feel God's presence, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that is what we're designed for. We're designed to worship Him. We're designed for His presence. We're designed to have encounters with Him, but for a purpose. So that when we leave these walls, the person at Walmart through the cashier can look at us and say, there's something different about you. Why are you so happy? I used to get that when I worked at UPS. I used to load trucks at UPS and unload trucks at UPS and they would, because you'd have to go to work at like two o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Jesus, I don't have to do that anymore. But they would say, why are you so happy? I'm like, I didn't know I was happy because I was grumpy. So that tells you the condition they were in. If they thought I was happy and I was like, dude, I'm not happy, I'm grumpy. And they're like, why are you so happy all the time? I'm like, I don't know why I'm so happy all the time. I thought I was grumpy. But my grumpy was their happy. 
because I had Jesus. The things that the thing I didn't do was share Jesus with them. I didn't tell them because I was selfish. You know, when we don't share Jesus with somebody that we know doesn't know him, can I just say it? Are you guys going to be mad at me? Pastor Bob's like, oh no, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> We're selfish. We want to, we want to, leave church and experience a really good time with the Lord and get a good word from God and we want to go to the restaurant and we want to eat. We want to leave a good tip. We want to bless the waitress and we want to leave. I'm guilty. I'm the, I'm the guiltiest. But the Lord is showing me, he's giving me an opportunity to not be selfish. He's like, will you give away what I have given you? Are you willing to give away all of the encounters that I have given you to somebody else who's never experienced me? And I am. Are you guys? Thinking about it? You don't have to jump in all at one time. Do you know that there's no place that you can go that he's not there? And he calls you by name. He doesn't call you by what you're feeling. He loves you unconditionally. And you know what? If you never shared Jesus with anybody, he'd still love you. He would because he loves you. He doesn't love you because you do something. He loves you because you're his kid. Aren't you grateful? And this is not to condemn anybody. You guys can stand up. This is not absolutely to condemn anybody. But what it is, is to bring an awareness. Say awareness. Awareness to what we need. What does our, what does our world need? We don't need a new president. We need a church. Well, we need a new president. <laughs> I mean, we do. But what I'm saying is, with a new president. We need a church that is out of a tomb. Somebody, somebody amen me down. Thank you. We need a church that is not in a tomb. We need a church that is actually alive. We need a church that actually believes that Jesus is alive and that we... <laughs> Do you know that when we get born again, we're called believers, not performers. We have a whole bunch of performers that don't believe. I believe that if we actually had a church that were believers, we would actually see an impact on our nation. Lord, help my unbelief to actually believe because we will live what we believe. Amen? And I believe that every single person here and watching online, their heart is to do what Jesus died for us to do. And that is to represent him to a world who is dying. Instead of hold, holding up a picket sign, protesting the thing that you believe in, we should hold up a picket sign that says Jesus loves you. I'm not against protesting. It's my right, you're right, do it, go for it. Have at it. That's fun. Whatever. But I love what Carl Anderson said. He said, make sure you die on the right hill. That hill should be Jesus. Calvary. Amen. Lord, I thank you for these people here this morning. God, I thank you that you are working and that you are moving. And I thank you that you are shifting and you are sifting. God, we give you permission to sift and to shift. We give you permission to convict us. We give you permission to put your finger on areas that we need to change. And God, we thank you that in everything, every circumstance that you are present, that you are there. 
And God, I ask that you would help us all be aware of your presence and your glory in every situation. God, I thank you for peace. I thank you for joy. God, I thank you for patience. I thank you for all the fruits of the Spirit that already dwell in us, that are being called out of us. So Holy Spirit, come and wreck us all, that we will look more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. I'm going to have the ministry team come up here. If you need prayer, if you want to just be blessed, come up here. Otherwise, have a great day. God bless you.